If you want a life of purpose, significance, meaning, I mean, who doesn't, right? You're in for a treat today because God has that for you and he has it for me. Today we're going to look at a miracle, the Messiah, and a message to multiply uh, all in, in, in one cool packet. Uh, we're in Luke chapter 5 today and there's lots of things. I'm going to do a little spoiler alert here. Uh, you're going to see in today's passage, Jesus is super popular. <laughs> you think Obama was popular during his days, or you think a Trump rally is crazy? It was crazy. Uh, people were captivated by Jesus. And you're going to see that in today's passage. You're also going to see that people really hunger for God's word. Uh, that's very encouraging for me because in a world of a lot of spin and propaganda and lies, it's super cool to know that people still want reality, actuality, and truth. They want it in the first century. People want it today. And people love when they, they hear someone that's like, this is different. This is authentic. This rings true. And Jesus was that. He's the way, the truth and the life, and they're gonna, you're going to see that people really were captivated by that. You're also going to see that in today's passage that men were the means with which Jesus wanted to reach the world. He's going to call everyday ordinary men because he saw that men were the way to reach women and children and the nations. So that kind of comes up today as he pulls these men together. They're, by the way, just rugged, ordinary, kind of blue jean kind of men. They're not academics. They're not politicians. Uh, these aren't people that were super religious. Uh, ordinary people to reach ordinary people. We're also going to see in today's passage, too, the importance of obedience. Um, I, you know, Sue and I raised five kids, and you know there was those moments where you just say, just do it, you know, you're telling your kids to do something, and they're like, why? And they, they want reasons, and it's like, because I said so, and it never flew really great. Well, with Jesus, there are, uh, there is a sense that if he says it, you probably should just do it. Why? It may not make sense to you. You may not feel like it's rational or logical, but Peter's going to show us, like, if you know who he is, you probably should just do it because of who he is. So we're going to see the importance of obedience, particularly when you feel like it doesn't make sense. You're also going to note in today's passage that Jesus never requires really just blind obedience. Even though we obey him, he is going to validate and authenticate who he is and what he's about, his authority, his deity, his gravity, with miracles. So he is going to give you something to go, you know, you can feel good about choosing to follow me because I'm something special. You're also going to see today in today's passage that the closer you are to Jesus, the more you see who he really is, holy, perfect, amazing, the more you're also going to see who you are. And that's not holy and perfect and amazing. So there is kind of an interesting paradox when you get close to love, you can see how unloving you are. When you get close to perfection, you see how imperfect you are. When you get close to God, you can kind of be undone a little bit. We'll see that in today's passage as well. We're also going to see in this passage, just uh, you think you're just uh, with Jesus and on the Sea of Galilee, so to speak, and fishermen, and you're going to see, well, actually... We're called to be fishers of men. Um, you're going to actually see our, our true calling and our purpose and significance in today's passage. Uh, we're to be lovers and servants of people. We're to be salt and light, peddlers of hope, physicians of the soul. You can ambassadors for Christ. You, you can give it whatever name you want. We're called to advance the Great Commission, to share the good news to be all about evangelism and discipleship and being influencers and impactors and igniters. And Jesus is just so savvy at talking to people in their own language. When he talks to Luke, a physician, he talks about being a physician of the soul. I mean, 
People that are healthy don't need a physician, but people who are sick do. That's why I've come. Here he's with fishermen. So you're going to see today, he's like, well, you're fishing for fish, but I'm going to make you fishers of men. So we're going to see kind of this calling to invite people to heaven into a new kind of kingdom given right here uh, to these fishermen. And then finally, we're going to see the response of Peter and some of these key disciples that the only appropriate, fitting, adequate response to who Jesus is when you recognize who he really is, is to leave everything and follow him. Like the only reasonable response for you and I, no matter what our profession is or vocation or avocation, it's ultimately our heart should go to God. He should be our first love. Uh, nothing should rival him. He's the pearl of great price. He's the treasure when you find it, you sell everything because it's like, that's what I want. And I think you're going to see that in today's passage in Luke 5. So to back up before we read our passage, we're in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is a great historian. He wrote another book in the Bible. What is that? The book of Acts. And Acts and Luke go together, by the way. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Luke writes a history of the life of Christ and then the history of the, the, the church after Christ ascends. What did the church do? So Luke, Acts are actually like two, two parts that go together. So Luke's a great historian. And he's going to point out for you how human uh, Jesus is. He's like a man, he talks like a man, he acts like a man, <laughs> he walks like a man. He's very, very, he's received as a man. But he's also going to record for you that he's not just a man. Like there's, there's something super different about him. And in today's passage, his divine nature and supernatural ministry and really his eternal essence are all revealed here. You're going to realize, wow, this is a cool dude. But he's not just a dude. He seems different. In fact, every, every essential thing you'd need to know about God's divine power, his omnipotence, his omniscience, it actually is kind of all in this passage today. Like if all you had were these 11 verses, you would know who Jesus is. If you just had this passage out of the Gospel of Luke, you would have a lot to know, wow, this guy's life-changing, and it changed these disciples' lives, and I'm hoping it'll change yours as well, and some of you know my own history of not really growing up in a Christian home. This is my hometown here, but studying in Germany in high school, getting in a car accident, reading the, the Bible, and uh, coming to Christ over in Germany, and this passage was one of the passages that really influenced me. I graduated from Hart High, went to UCLA, came on staff with Crew and Campus Crusade, and I remember them interviewing me and saying, like, when were you called to full-time ministry? And I'm like, what? what? <laughs> What's the question? I didn't, you can do another job? I had no idea. When I read this passage for the first time, they dropped their nets and followed him. I had no idea you could actually do another job and still walk with Christ. Well, you can, but your heart should be fully occupied with Christ, whether you're a butcher, or baker, or candlestick maker, you're not there to make muffins. You're there to impact people for the good. And whether I'm repping a basketball game, preaching on a Sunday, or shopping at Walmart, those are just platforms that we are able to show up and try to be salt and light to people and to make a difference. And today, hopefully, this will impact you as well. Okay, are you ready to read our 11 verses for today? Let's read them, and then we'll unpack them. There's lots in here. It's so, it's so good. Anyway, okay, Luke 5, starting in verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowded around him, and they were listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats. They were left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from the shore, and then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out uh, into the deep water and let the nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, uh, 
we've worked like all night and we haven't caught anything, but because you say so, <laughs> we'll let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. So here's our passage today in Luke 5. As always, we want to try to keep this passage in context, so I want to take you back to chapter 4, if you will, uh, the chapter right before this, and go, before we get to chapter 5, what was Jesus doing? Well, if you're in chapter 4, the first 13 verses is Jesus in the wilderness with the devil, and he's telling uh, the devil that, you know, we're called to worship the Lord and to serve him only. So we see a little precursor that the goal of life is to serve God and to worship him. We see in verses 14 to 30 that Jesus says no prophet is accepted in his hometown. <laughs> so Jesus is in his hometown, and I'm in my hometown. And I don't know why that would ever happen. You shouldn't do that, because you're usually not received well in your hometown, because everyone knows your stuff, right? Uh, it's better to go somewhere else where you look like an expert, you know. But he, he acknowledges that people were a little hostile to him locally, um, and that's mentioned here in uh, chapter 4. Later in chapter 4, in verses 31 to 36, Jesus drives out an unclean spirit, a demon, if you will. And this is interesting. I want to share this with you because Jesus is going to reveal himself in chapter 5 through this miracle to Peter and the disciples in a way he hadn't done before. But he had already just cast out some demons, and the demon says, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. So, and Jesus says to the demon, shh, quiet. In other words, like, button it, shut up, <laughs> zip it. Like, I I'm not there yet. <laughs> I don't want everyone to know that yet, but the demons know. So I think that's interesting going into chapter 5. Uh, Jesus has already been exposed. He did the, the, the miracle at the wedding of Cana in Galilee. So there's, there's that. And now the demons are saying, we know who you are. And Jesus tells the demons, like, shh, you know, quiet. We also know something interesting, because remember, he's, he's going to have this conversation with Simon. Simon is actually who? Peter, right? It's Simon Peter. His name's going to change. It actually is mentioned both in, in this passage. But when he's with Simon in chapter 4, Simon actually invites him over to his home. So before he has this conversation in the fishing boat, Simon has already invited Jesus into his home. And when he's in his home, the scriptures tell us that his mother-in-law was sick. She had a fever. And Jesus is going to heal the fever. Well, I don't know about you. The first church I went to was OLPH on Lyons Avenue. You know, like I went to a Catholic church because I played in a Catholic baseball league when I think was seven, and you had to go to church, or otherwise you couldn't play, right? First base, second, third, and home. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> Anyways, so to my Catholic friends, I thought Jesus, uh, I thought Peter was like the first pope. I thought he was like the celibate first pope or something. Here, this passage in chapter four says, no, he has a mother-in-law. Well, that means he's married. That means Peter has a wife. Uh, and he's going to heal the mother-in-law. So I don't want to derail here, but I was just like, what? That's cool. Okay, anyways. And so we see in chapter 4 that he's married, 
He's healing people. Demons are disclosing who Jesus is. Um, Jesus kind of tells them to, to chill. And the chapter ends with him saying, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom to the other towns because that is why I was sent. So Jesus is doing miracles. People are crowding around. It even says in chapter four that they were so they weren't really letting Jesus go. So Jesus is like, oh my gosh, he's like a rock star already. And it's like he can't, he has to kind of find ways to escape. That's all prior to chapter five. So when we get to chapter five, he has already disclosed the most important thing is not the miracle, but the message. He keeps saying, I want, I need to preach the good news to other people. He doesn't say, I want to keep doing miracles. The miracles are to authenticate that you would know who he is, so you believe the good news. The good news was to bring the truth to people so they could really embrace Jesus as a, in a personal way and God. So I think that's important for our setup. Anyways, with that, are you ready to unpack these verses now? Let's go back to verse 1. It says, now one day, after he did all that in chapter 4 that we just talked about, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, Gennesaret is, a, is known by another name. You probably know it by the Sea of Galilee. They're the same lake. Sea of Galilee is a little bit misleading because it's not really a sea, it's a lake. It's a fresh water lake. It's a 13 mile by seven mile uh, lake, <laughs> but it has different names. Gennesaret, Sea of Galilee, uh, some of the Romans called it the Sea of Tiberias. That's fine. Of course, they want to name it after their, their poobahs, you know. So he's, he's at this lake. This lake has key cities on it like Tiberias, uh, Capernaum, uh, other lakes. Jesus spent a lot of time here. And he loved preaching here because when you're at this lake, if any of you been, by the way, the Sea of Galilee? Some of you? Yeah. It's cool. It kind, kind of, it's sloped. So if you're down by the water, it's kind of like an amphitheater, you know, like the, the, the beach kind of slopes up and it's really a great place to teach because the, 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 the voice bounces off the water and it's kind of contained. Uh, it's filled with water from the Lebanese mountains that the snow melts and it comes into the Sea of Galilee. So it, he, Jesus loved teaching here. So here he is and he says the people, many of them, by the way, were crowding or pressing around him and listening to the word of God. Now, one, it's just cool. People want to hear the word of God. But remember, we're in Luke 5. We're not in the 21st century. When we think of the word of God, right, you're probably thinking like, oh, he's, he's, teaching, he's teaching from the word of God. He, that's not what this verse says. The canon hadn't been formed yet. The New Testament wasn't written yet. And he's not quoting Old Testament scripture. This verse means they were eager to hear God talk, God speak, words from God. In other words, Jesus is God. When Jesus speaks, he is speaking the word of God. Jesus isn't like me. I study my booty off all week to make sure you know the history and the context and how big was the lake and what, how, what size were the boats and who was there and what's the background. He didn't have to do that. He didn't study anything. We have no verses or any context where we see Jesus in a library. He, he's not a researcher. He knows all things. He's the creator of all things. He just speaks. And they were hungry to hear God speak. They weren't hungry to hear someone quote something. I have to quote something. Preachers have to, like, we, we're, we're restricted by the text. We're here to unpack the text, not, you know, who cares about Dave's opinion, right? That's true when I ref, too, by the way, right? Because <laughs> I'm like, who cares if your shirts are tucked in? But the NC2A apparently cares, so you got to tuck it in. Why? Because they, I just do what they tell me to do. I'm here to represent the NC2A, not like Dave's view of basketball. And same on Sunday, like it's not Dave's thoughts, we're here to like, what did God say? But here it says they were listening 
to the word of God. And I just want you to know that they're not listening to a sermon coming out of a text. They're listening to God speak. They believed there was something unique about Jesus in sharing the kingdom, in sharing the good news, in sharing about heaven, that, that the, the poor could be spiritually rich, that, that the prisoners of sin could be set free with forgiveness, that the spiritually blind could be given sight, that the spiritually oppressed could be liberated. Like he spoke about forgiveness and eternal life and salvation, and he was super popular. I mean, people were coming to Jesus like uh, illegal immigrants are coming into our country. Right? You see that on the news today? It's like, we're being invaded. Like, well, apparently they're hearing that it's free to come to the U.S. and we'll pay for stuff and give you money. It's like, well, they're coming. And I suspect there was that in the first century, too, that people were like, this guy does miracles. So that alone would like get people like, well, I want to see this. But the text says people actually are hungry to hear God's words. So it wasn't just razzle-dazzle. There were a lot of people who were like, this guy speaks different than the Caesars speak different than the pharaohs spoke, different than, more specifically, the Jewish leaders. He doesn't speak like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes. He speaks with one who has authority. He's embodied the truth. The crowds are mentioned in chapter 5, 6, 8, 9, 12, 13, 14 as being so crowding it was crazy. In fact, in chapter 12, it says they were stepping on each other. There were so many people trying to hear Jesus. So he's very, very popular at this point. He's a great communicator, super clear in thought, the best teacher there is, the source of truth, and had an authority. He's never sharing an opinion or a viewpoint or a philosophy or he's not even really a theologian. He's God. He's just speaking <laughs> actuality. And people loved it. That's why in John 5, 24, it says, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who, who, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. If you hear me speak and you just believe it, you're in. That's, <laughs> that's how powerful it was. Anyways, verse two, we must press on. Go, go, go. So off to the side, he saw at the water's edge, uh, standing next to the Sea of Galilee, the, the, the Lake of Gennesaret, th there were two boats there. They were unattended by the fishermen. They were left there because the fi fishermen were washing and scrubbing their nets. Uh, and th that's not uncommon. This is probably about 11 in the morning, maybe, maybe noon. Uh, the fishermen fished at night because it's really hot and the, 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 the fish don't want to be caught, so they don't want to be seen near the surface of the water in the daylight, and they don't come up into the shore. They go into the deep, deep parts. That's why you fish at night, because the fish do come to the surface. Uh, I, I'm told fishermen today say when it's cloudy or overcast, like the fishing's usually better because the fish do come higher up, and uh, when they put the nets in, they're able to grab more fish. So. They've been fishing all night, so Jesus comes, and the, the boats are already on the side, and they're, they're working on the nets. The daytime was the time to scrub the boats, get the nets right, fix everything. If there's any tears or whatever, like, get everything set because you're going to fish during the nighttime. And by the way, fishing was a grueling, I, I would be terrible, I'd be a terrible fisherman. <laughs> it, it was just a grueling job, very, very consuming, day and night, um, Lots, lots to do. Uh, these were men that had uh, gnarled fingers and calluses, I'm sure. You know, they just were blue-collar guys working super hard. And they're in fairly large boats. I don't know exactly how large they are, but I know from Mark 4, Mark 6, and Matthew 8, 13 people were in the boats. We have all the disciples in the boat. We have Jesus in the boat. One of them, Jesus, is sleeping. So... There's got to be enough room on the boat. I mean, it's not a rowboat. You know, it's a big boat that over a dozen people could at least fit on. So we, we know that. It had beams and winches and a sail and a deck and a hold below the deck and stuff. So we've got a sizable boat here, and there's a couple of them while the fishermen are doing their nets. Verse 3. So Jesus got into 
One of the boats, by the way, this is super important, the one belonging to who? Simon, to Peter. Uh, that's intentional, by the way. Jesus knows that Simon is the leader. Simon, he was super feisty and probably a little egocentric and you know, he had some issues. He needed to see therap a therapist, but God's gonna work it out with him, right? You know, he, oh, I can walk on water, you know. Well, oh, no, maybe I can't. So he sticks his foot in his mouth. He's, he's a leader, but Jesus knows this is the leader. In fact, in all four gospels, uh, when the, uh, the, the disciples are listed, Peter's always listed first. So he's the main guy. Um, God gets to pick who he wants to pick. He's chosen this guy. He's a maverick. And he's like, I'm going with this guy because he's either going to lead people off a cliff or he's going to lead people into like eternal life. <laughs> and so he systematically, strategically is like, I'm getting in Simon's boat because I need to spend some time with Simon. I, I really want Simon Peter to see what's going on. So this is super intentional. He gets into Simon's boat and uh, he's really ready to take Simon to another level, if you will. He's already been in his home. We looked at that in chapter four. We know from John one, he'd already seen him before and says, hey, hey maybe you wanna follow me and check me out. And so Peter had been checking Jesus out, but he's ready to take him like to the next level. And so he has a little time with Peter and he asked Peter to put out a little bit more from the, the shore. Why? Because there's so many people here that they're, they're pushing Jesus like he's, he's like getting into the water. And so he's like, let's get in the boat. I'm getting in your boat. And I want you to push out a little bit. If the boat gets out a little bit, it forms like a cool arc and it's basically a little floating podium, I guess, right? You know, I wanted to bring water in today to give you that effect, but <laughs> I just decided it's a hassle. So anyways, he's, he's in this floating podium <laughs> and he's got this arc and he's in that kind of amphitheater along the side so e everyone can hear and he can get his peripheral vision with those that are watching. And then it says he, uh, now that he's kind of anchored out there, he sat down, which was the teaching posture of uh, these uh, rabbinical traditional teachers of the time. And it says he taught the people from the boat. He taught all the people that were standing on the shore from the boat, and he loves this. Jesus loves teaching. He loves sharing the gospel. He loves, you know, sharing the way of salvation. And we know from lots of scriptures, you know, lots of these, like Romans 10, you know, how can people hear unless there's someone that says something to them, unless someone preaches to them? You know, how can they uh, believe in their heart and trust God? And how can they confess with their mouth unless someone tells them? And so Jesus came to seek and save the lost and to bring them to the truth. So he's teaching him the truth, and he loves it. Like, this is like his, his deal. Verse four says, after a while, after he had finished speaking, so he gives a, some little sermonette, uh, some message, some God truth, he says to Simon Peter, now that we, we put out a little ways, uh, now go out into the deep and let down the nets for a catch a catch of fish, like, let's go out. I, I have an object lesson for you, Peter. Um, push on out, uh, let's, go, let's go get some fish. Okay, it doesn't totally tell me what Simon Peter's thinking here, but I suspect he's like, okay, I'm the fisherman, you're a carpenter. This is my lake. This is what I do all day. This is what I just did all night. Like, this is my expertise. I don't know if he was thinking this, but I think he could have thought like Jesus, stay in your lane, okay? Um, nice suggestion, but it's also daytime. I already know, fish don't come to the surface during the daytime. This is not, like <laughs> this is the heat of the day. This is not the time to go fishing. Um, so fortunately, we don't have to totally guess what was Jesus hearing from Peter. It says to us in verse five, Simon, probably perplexed, answered and said, master, which is a cool way of saying like chief commander or the one in authority. Uh, we've, we've worked hard, like we've labored 
all night, you know, trying to catch fish, and well, we, we haven't caught anything, you, <laughs> zero, <laughs> not even a minnow. Uh, I'm a, a little frustrated, perhaps, I'm reading into the text here, but, but because you say so, I'm going to be somewhat polite about this, I'll let down the nets. And this is one of those, uh, he seems a little reluctant, but he's obedient. And you probably have situations in your life where you're like, this is my lane. Like, I am the butcher, or the baker. Or the, like, I know what I'm doing here. But God says to you, like, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do this. And you're like, that doesn't make sense. But it's God. It doesn't have to make sense. If he says, we're going out in midday when you never catch fish, typically, and I want you to let your nets down, it, Peter's like, Okay, we've been doing this all night. That doesn't make any sense. But because you said so, we'll do it. What happens? Verse 6, well, when they, these professional fishermen, had done so, just as Jesus said, they caught <laughs> in midday such a large number of fish. The quantity was catastrophic it was so huge <laughs> that their nets actually began to break to tear and to snap i mean you can just picture the water churning and bubbling and the fish uh, all over the place it's crazy they're probably starting to get a little bit clearer like hmm this doesn't normally happen <laughs> Uh, this is a lot of fish. They're a little panicked in verse 7, so they called out, they signaled, it means kind of motioned and <laughs> waved to their partners, uh, James and John, sons of thunder, these are feisty guys too, in the other boat, to come and help them. And they came, and it filled both boats. It, there were so many <laughs> fish that they actually began to sink. So these professional fishermen are like, overwhelmed. They're shocked. They're astonished. It's dawning on them. I'm not sure how. It doesn't give us all the details, but we know when fish are available. They're not available. This, but now, somehow, maybe the creator of the fish, maybe the creator of the lake, Maybe Dr. Doolittle has talked to all the fish and invited them all to jump into our nets, and every fish in the lake came. But something just happened that we never see happen. Even the fish respond to this man. The fish are really jumping to their death at the bidding of their creator. But they're there. The boats are sinking. There's so many fish here. This is so crazy. Well, verse 8 says, when Simon Peter saw this, he doesn't say, we should go into business together. This is unbelievable. <laughs> he doesn't say, wow. Do you know how much money we're going to make on the fish we just hauled in today? We could go like 50 50, mm -hmm. and like we could do the Jesus Peter fishing uh, store or whatever. It, it doesn't do anything like that. When, he, when it dawns on him who he's with, he's terrified. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell down. It means bows, he, he kneels down at Jesus' knees, his feet, if you will, and said, go away from me, Lord. Uh, why would he say, go away from me? <laughs> well, it tells us. I'm a sinful man. Like, oh my gosh, I'm with God. Uh, I'm, I'm overwhelmed when I see you for who you are, I see me for who I am. And when I look at other people, I'm like, I'm kind of cool, you know, like I don't have the issues they have. But when I compare myself to you, I'm like, oh, I'm undone. 
I feel like Isaiah felt, or Job, who's like, I'm, I'm undone. Or John, remember when he said the, the revelation? John gets a vision of Jesus, and he passes out. He faints. He's like, <laughs> they have to wake him up. <laughs> you hoo hello, get your parchment and pen. I have a revelation. I'm gonna re He's like, I'm overwhelmed. Yeah, when you're with holiness, it's undoing. And by the way, some of you have already experienced this. When people with, are with you, they're uncomfortable. Once people know you're a true follower of Christ, you're committed to the Lord, that you're a serious believer, man or woman of faith, people are going to be uncomfortable with you. And it's not because you and I are so holy, but we know the Holy One. We are aligned with someone who's perfect and holy and sovereign and providential, and that's uncomfortable. Sometimes people will ask, why aren't the churches more filled with people? Why don't people more, or like, it, it, you guys are so loving and great. It's like, this is why <laughs> churches aren't totally filled because you get confronted with your sin when you get into the word of God. <laughs> it's not all like jelly beans and butterflies, and it's not like, well, if you go to a liberal church, you can get that. It's a love fest. But when you come to the word of God, you get that God loves you. But we have to deal with reality. You are sinful, fallen, broken, and evil. It's like, I don't want to hear that. I, I, I need something positive. Life's already too hard. Um, but here, Peter gets a, do a dose of it, which is, oh my gosh, I'm undone with you. And he wants to push away from Jesus, and Jesus wants to embrace him. See, it's only when you realize how sinful you are, that mercy and compassion and grace actually work. So that's, Jesus knows he's got him. This is the, the feisty Simon Peter. Now he's, he's making some headway. Yeah, he says, I'm a sinful man and I'm a little bit undone and it's a little bit uncomfortable. Anyways, verse 9 for he and all his companions, the other fishermen, they were completely astonished. It means amazed, awestruck, agog, if you will, uh, at the catch of fish that they had taken in. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. These are two really feisty dudes, um, Simon's partners. They're co-workers with him in their fishing business. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. Like, I'm glad that you're terrified on one level, but you don't need to be scared. Because I'm for you. I'm with you. I love you. And I care for you. But he goes on to say, from now on, you're going to fish for people. Now that I know you know that you're sinful, broken, and unholy, now that I know that you're useful, you're not a self-righteous, you know, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. We're like this, hello, He's my, like, fishing partner. Now that I know you're not arrogant and narcissistic, now that I know you've been humbled, you're useful. And now instead of catching fish, which is your now avocation, your real vocation is you're going to be a fisher of men. You're going to be captivating and catching the souls of men. The, the Greek word here is zagreo, is from two words, agreo to catch, and zoe. We actually get our English word like zoo from that. It means life. A zoo is a um, park of life. So he's like, you're going to be catching live people. When you catch fish, they die. You're going to catch people, and they're going to live. <laughs> you're going to be catching people so they can finally live. Super, super cool. Well, what happened as a result? Verse 11, so they pulled their fish-heavy <laughs> boats up onto the shore, onto the beach, onto the land. They left everything. That means their boats, their nets, their fame, their glory, their business, their riches, their power, their ideals, and they followed him and never turned back. Wow. So today, if you want uh, 
a life of purpose and significance and meaning, I think there's a lot in today's passage for you. One, Jesus was super popular, um, more popular than an Obama event or a Trump rally or some rock concert. In the first century, without all that media and that hype, it, he was he was like the he was the place to be. God is still looking for people who are hungry for the the word for truth, a word from God, God's word, not what Fox News has to say or MSNBC or Oprah's latest spin or even Jordan Peterson. People want to hear God speak. They wanted it in the first century. They want it today, and we need it now more than ever in a day that people don't even know what a man or a woman is and everything's so confusing. It's like, could someone be clear and concise about transcendent truth, objective reality, not subjective opinions? Yes, Jesus gives us that. We also see from today the importance of obedience. There are times where <laughs> you might feel Jesus says to you, like, take the, take the boat out midday when you normally don't, and I want you to drop your nets, and you're like, whoa, <laughs> wait. <laughs> you're in my lane now, and I kind of know what I'm doing. I've done this a long time. If Jesus says it, you might just want to do what Peter was smart enough to do, which is, I don't know, but because you said so, I will. I will. And then Jesus doesn't say, well, now you just have to blindly do what I say. He gives them a miracle like, aren't you glad? See? I'm giving you something tangible to believe in. But also, when you know who I am, you're going to start to see who you are. And you really are nobody on some level, right? That'll bring people to church. Come to church. We'll tell you what a nobody you are. <laughs> But then again, you are somebody because of who you know. In other words, in spite of us, God is using us on our cul-de-sac, our little firehouse, our basketball team, wherever he can use you to make a difference. Your reality business, you know, whatever. Whether you're selling a home or, again, a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, like schoolhouse, you get to make a difference because of who you know. And then when you see differences happen and you know they're not because of you, because you know who you are. And finally, I think this passage is significant, not just because it's a miracle. It is a miracle, but the miracle was a sign. It was to point to Jesus, to authenticate and verify who he is, that this is someone that's worthy of you following. This is someone worthy of leaving everything you have. This is someone like, e even if you keep your business, your heart wants to go with him because your business becomes a platform to do what he's called you to do, to be part of the Great Commission, to advance the kingdom, to love people, to be salt and light, to be peddlers of hope, to be ambassadors of the light um, in a world of darkness. Like, you get to do that. And the only reasonable response I think Peter models for us is, if you really want your life to count as an influencer, an impactor, an igniter, be a fisher of men. And why wouldn't you leave everything to do that? Uh, why wouldn't you follow him wherever he leads? Uh, that was the model Peter gave us in today's miracle. Amen? Amen.